A family heartbroken to find their father's World War II medallion stolen from his grave. How they hope whoever did this can make it right. Local businesses now adjusting to the new normal as stores reopen. While some places are requiring masks, we'll show you why others are not pushing for it. Plus, new details tonight in the search for JJ and Tylee, including what we're learning about the mysterious beliefs of their mother and her new husband. And she disappeared five years ago. Now there's a new push to find Elizabeth Salgado's killer. And as we look at radar, we're still finding scattered rain showers, thunderstorms. Could they spill over into your Monday morning commute? I'll let you know in the forecast. Live from Fox 13 Studios, this is Fox 13 News at 9. Our top story tonight, a family is pleading for the return of their father's Purple Heart after they say the medallion was torn and stolen from his grave. Yeah, the medallion has been attached to the headstone since he passed away seven years ago. As Fox 13's L. Thomas reports, the family wants to know why the medallion was taken. He said the word hero is used way too much nowadays. Here at the Roy City Cemetery, I consider him a hero, lies Glenn Lewis Wallace. He loved the country. He was very patriotic. The story of his life is one of integrity, honor, and service. Honoring him is important to us. Injured at war, Peggy's father bore a scar for 68 years. It reminded us of our dad, of, of what he sacrificed. Now, seven years after his death, his headstone dons another one. How dare you? A yellow stain, two holes. That's kind of the last, the last honor that we had. And a missing World War II medallion. It just is a personal thing. All of a sudden it's like, what? Really, there's people that will do that? Disheartened, upset. It was for us, you know. Peggy knows they may never see the stolen medallion again. But she also knows her father will always be close to her heart. I'm linked to him, and he's linked to me. And maybe I can have some of that. Get it done. Just do it. Get through it. At this point, the family says they just want this scar to be gone and the medallion to be back. They do plan on filing a report with Roy City Police. If you have information, go ahead and give them a call. In Roy L. Thomas, Fox 13 News, Utah. Now to the latest COVID-19 numbers in Utah. We now have almost 5,200 people who have tested positive for the virus, up almost 200 people from yesterday. A Salt Lake County woman has died from the novel coronavirus, putting the death total count now at 50. The state's positive rate remains steady at 4.2%. As Utah begins to reopen, businesses are making changes to adjust to the new normal. And from barbershops to big grocery chains, Fox 13's Spencer Joseph shows us why some stores are requiring customers to wear masks, but some are not. It's just an extra layer of precaution. It's one thing that people can do. Andrew Wittenberg with the Salt Lake City Department of Economic Developments is talking about masks. Salt Lake County Mayor Jenny Wilson gave the orders last week that all employees must wear masks, but stopped short of requiring it for all customers, leaving that decision to businesses. Nail salons, and you're getting a haircut at a barbershop um, or a massage, where you're in close proximity, we know the masks are still vitally important. Stores like Kroger and Costco that have seen long lines are requiring masks, but a smaller local market like Caputo's says they haven't needed to take that step. You know, we haven't been swamped like your Costco's or your grocery stores. You know, as a, as a specialty food store, we've been really lucky with the community support. These new orders that started on May 1st have had little impact on them because they're already taking these precautions and then some. Since March 12th, we implemented a really strict uh, sick policy, contact surfaces and things like that, sanitizing those every 30 minutes. We put the X marks on the floor for a long time now, with masks and face shields for our, our staff. And Matt Caputo, CEO of Caputo's Market, says their customers and employees have been exemplary through this time. A really great food community showing up for us and then our crew just being able to just turn and pivot on a dime as you know, Cheesemongers doing delivery now, uh, chefs 
packing online orders, things they never signed up for, but are just doing it with a smile. So whether it's a big grocery store or a local market, a nail salon or a barber shop. So it's something each individual business owner will likely have to uh, make a personal decision on their own what they want to do. And the Salt Lake City Department of Economic Development has a lot of resources for businesses questioning during this time. You can find that information linked on our website, fox13now.com. In Salt Lake City, Spencer Joseph, Fox 13 News, Utah. Meanwhile, two malls in northern Utah will open back up to the public this week. The Fashion Place Mall will once again allow customers starting Tuesday, May 5th. It will be open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday and from noon to 6 p.m. on Sunday. But not all stores will be open. And on Wednesday, the City Creek Shopping Center will also open starting at 11 a.m. and they will encourage customers to wear masks. The play areas there will remain closed and water fountains will be turned off. Both malls, though, plan extra sanitation to keep customers safe. Well, meteorologist Breck Bolton with us now. Breck, we saw some areas were still seeing some afternoon showers, maybe into the early evening. Are they done for the night and over evening, overnight hours? Well, we're still holding on to those showers, at least across portions of central into northeastern Utah. I want to just share a photo coming in from a viewer. It kind of paints the picture of what we're expecting in a transition as we look in Fairview. This is in central Utah. Jane Tucker sending this. Yeah, we got stormy clouds, but a break in the clouds, and we're going to see a break at least across northern into central Utah. But for some of us, there's still a possibility of seeing some late evening into the early morning hours with some rain that has an impact and even some isolated thunderstorms. As you can see across the map, Doppler radar incorporating central, northern, northeastern Utah, southwest Wyoming, we've got some wet weather. Showers currently very isolated as they make their move through Juab County, Utah County as well. We've kind of seen this area be a rain zone here over the past 24 hours. More active weather once again as we go from Duchesne over towards Vernal. We're seeing some thunderstorms having uh, an impact as you can see through Vernal. And it looks like that could be the case here as another wave coming through. So the next hour or two, we could still look at some moderate to heavy rainfall, gusty winds, some lightning in addition. Now along the Wasatch front, kind of a break, but we don't have to look too far to see we've got another round of rain beginning to track through as we're seeing some scattered rain showers in Box Elder County, Tooele County as well. As we get a little bit wider viewpoint, you can see the movement of this moisture coming in from the southwest, moving northeast. So in its sight, you can see at least from Salt Lake City up through Logan, in the next hour or so, we could see rain kind of as a resurgence where we could see those wet conditions in the overnight hours. The big question is, though, will they linger into the morning commute? Well, we know for tonight we're going to see that possibility of a chance of some brief rain showers. Should be okay to go as we start off your Monday morning. But are we going to see more rain? And how's the rest of the week look? We'll let you know coming up. Tonight, we have bizarre new information uncovered in the case of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell. They're at the center of the disappearance of Lori's two children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. But this time, we're learning more about their mysterious beliefs. According to emails obtained by Fox 10 in Phoenix, Arizona, Chad told Lori that he could judge, quote, light and dark spirits. And he even sent her a list ranking the spirits of family members they know, even JJ and Tylee, on this light to dark scale. Past friends of Chad are now calling his teachings false doctrine. If that isn't a cult leader, I don't know what is. That's where I am now because he was going around saying things in people's homes, going to people. Now, whether they joined a cult or realized that that's what he was trying to do or not, he won't call it a cult. I think he thinks he's starting a church. JJ and Tylee have been missing since last September. Lori Vallow Daybell remains in an Idaho jail on charges connected to their disappearance. Chad Daybell remains a free man, but he is under investigation by the Idaho Attorney General's office for the death of his previous wife, Tammy. Also new tonight, there's a renewed effort to find the person who killed Elizabeth Salgado. She vanished five years ago after leaving her English class in downtown Provo. Her remains were eventually found by a hiker in Hobble Creek Canyon nearly two years after her disappearance. Now there's a new website that launched today built for people to submit information so they can piece together the timeline of what happened before her death. ElizabethSalgado.info was set up by the Salgado family's attorney. 
A Logan company accused of price gouging over its hand sanitizer sales is responding to the claims. EK USA makes the Corona Crap hand sanitizer. According to their website, the company sells a bucket containing 48 individual one ounce bottles for $477. A local man filed a complaint with the Utah Division of Consumer Protection. That agency says this is still an ongoing investigation and cannot provide further comment. The EKUSA CEO Ed Kalbach telling Fox 13, quote, I'm not price gouging. He also said that coronavirus crap sanitizer is, quote, not your typical sanitizer and that you get 200 sprays out of the product. He admitted that he's had some issues with some suppliers over the price tag because they don't understand how, quote, different it is. A Salt Lake man who was behind the wheel during a crash that killed a four-year-old boy and injured his mother, uh, mother rather, has learned his fate. Court documents show 57-year-old Carl Wayne Johnson has been sentenced to up to 15 years in prison for a slew of charges, including automobile homicide and DUI. Johnson ran over this boy, Holden Curtis, and his mother, Ashley, at a crosswalk at California Avenue and 9th West last November. Johnson had three prior DUI convictions before this most recent deadly crash. After months of undercover investigation, nine people have been indicted for their connection to an illegal gambling machine ring. And this ring made upwards of $8 million a year. Salt Lake County DA, DA Sim Gill's office filed charges that include money laundering, transferring firearms and possession or use of controlled substances. The key behind all of this, though, they say, was the gambling machines. One of the people indicted is believed to be the owner of a few city corner stores across Salt Lake County. The DA says more arrests could be made in this case. Still ahead, some state parks in southern Utah reaching their maximum capacity for two weeks in a row. How Gunlock State Park is handling all the crowds and other challenges. And hear about a special, special message Taylor Swift made to a local nurse on the front lines. Welcome back. Time now for our tech report. Now, the lack of regular sports on TV is making way for esports on channels like ESPN. But with this newfound interest comes a new problem for the esports community. Even in the middle of a pandemic, gamers are still competing in esports competitions. And according to the director of esports operations at the University of Utah, finding more qualified coaches is becoming more difficult having the right influence and the right mentors to teach kids how to do this and how to cope with winning well and how to cope with losing well is skill sets that are very valuable and things that we could use more of. Right now, the U of U says they've been fortunate enough to find good coaches and assistant coaches, but there's a chance they could struggle to find their next one. A Utah nurse got a heartfelt surprise from Taylor Swift this weekend, complete with a box full of merchandise and a handwritten letter. Swift gave two reasons for sending all of this to Whitney Hilton, one to celebrate Hilton's 30th birthday and second to personally thank the Ogden nurse for going to New York and working on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. The letter said in part, I wanted to send you some presents and to let you know I am so grateful for you. I can't thank you enough for risking your life to help people and for spreading the message loudly that people need to hear about taking this seriously. In a tweet, Whitney posted these photos and said this was the best day of her life. The Great Salt Lake State Park is now inviting more visitors. The park has been open through the pandemic, but it now also has its visitor center and snack bar back open as well. Park officials want people to adhere to social distancing guidelines while visiting the park. They say there is more than enough room to enjoy the lake. It's beautiful out here. Uh, the water's great. This is a great place to come and practice social distancing because we do have large beaches and come out and enjoy the park and just practice good social distancing and be safe. The visitor center is open from 11 in the morning to 7 at night, and the Salty Shore Snack Shack is open during the same time on the weekends. And a lot of spots reopening. Breck, you mentioned earlier today that Lake Powell will st slowly start to reopen, but the big question, is the nice weather going to go along with that? Well, I think so for this week. Just to let you know, I'm making some plans to maybe hit a reservoir 
by the middle of the week as temperatures are quickly going to be warming up. But speaking of reservoirs, I got this photo from a viewer. This is Jane Sumberg, Red Fleet State Park. And this is just north of Vernal. Yeah, beautiful weather there. Look at that water. It's glass. Water temperature, though, at about 49 degrees. That's still a little too cold for me. But they did see some boats out there doing some wakeboarding. You need a dryer wetsuit to do so. But nice day, at least there throughout the morning. But for some of the state, Today we had clouds, we had some rain showers. We started off a little rainy in Salt Lake City, but we did make it up to 70 degrees. We had kind of a mixture of some sun and clouds, bringing back the clouds here for tonight. And I don't know if we're quite done with the rain quite yet. We've got a possibility here in the overnight hours. But again, on average, we should be in the upper 60s as we're heading back to the 70s and even 80s along the Wasatch Front. But here are your official highs across the state where, where we didn't have the cloud cover. It was warm across southern Utah. Mid 80s for highs today in Moab, 86 in St. George, even close to 80 degrees in Milford. It was central to northern Utah where we've been contending with the rain and the clouds and still holding on to some moisture even at this hour. Currently, though, we're at 63 degrees in Salt Lake City. Not seeing much rain activity right now. Actually, a break across most of the Wasatch Front. We stand at 58 degrees in Provo. And looking ahead, speaking about getting outdoors, here's your outdoor play forecast for the kids or for anyone that's doing any recreational activities, some hiking, jogging, biking. Green lights Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. High pressure building in. But yes, it does get warm by Wednesday. I need to get those air conditioners working just a little bit as we're going to have a few days in the 80s across northern Utah. But as I said right now, though, still holding on to some clouds, some rain showers, and it's been mainly central towards northeastern Utah where we've seen some of the heaviest rainfall and even some thunderstorms continue to develop and roll through areas such as Vernal over towards Duchesne. Now, as we look across northern Utah, we've got another round that's lining up. This is more of a light, maybe moderate rain that could potentially move along the Wasatch front. It's moving from the southwest to the northeast and in its sights I think it's going to be hitting the north end of Salt Lake Valley but across Weber Davis County then moving towards the Utah Idaho border in the overnight hours. We've got some dry out there. High pressure wants to work in and bring that war in, uh, warm air. It's going to be kind of a slow warm up in that we're actually going to find temperatures cooler tomorrow as this cold front continues to track through the state and then it quickly rebounds thereafter. But let's talk about that threat of showers and what you can expect for your Monday uh, morning and afternoon commutes. We've got the rain here tonight. After midnight, still seeing some showers, even near Nephi, close to the southern end of Utah County. But by tomorrow morning, you can see we start off maybe with some clouds, but really looks to be dry. So we might see a little standing water with the rain that hits overnight, but during the morning commute, not a concern. And we're gonna keep it dry and sunny all day long, that high pressure moves in. Some clouds rolling through central Utah tomorrow night, but really the threat of showers quickly decreases and the thermometer back on the rise. But we'll hold on to that possibility of some rain showers. Again, northeastern through uh, uh, central Utah, but even along the Wasatch Front for the next two or three hours. Then tomorrow it's sunny. Cooler though, but temperatures more in line where they should be for this time of year. Mid to upper 60s as we go from Ogden through Provo. Even seeing some 60s in price where you're close to 70 degrees today. A little cooler in Moab. So hold on to the mid 80s in St. George. You don't have the winds tomorrow. You keep the sunshine around though and temperatures do warm. We're in the mid 90s by Wednesday. So it's talking about hitting the lakes, the reservoirs. I know they've just been flooded with people and maybe that possibility next weekend. As you can see, you want to get some relief as temperatures stay in the 90s for several days. Northern Utah is 60s to 70s to 80s on Wednesday. A little cooler Thursday with another front. Doesn't look like it'll bring much rain, but then warming back up in the 80s next weekend. So those are your target dates. Yeah, if you want to go hit some of those reservoirs, go to the Great Salt Lake. You're not going to get any rain to go along with it, but temperatures well above normal. And I get going and needing some relief, especially in southern Utah, but oh. you showed the pictures of people out boating in here in northern Utah. I They're know. brave. Yesterday in Hiram and even today, yeah. more power to them. Might be hitting Willow Bay on Wednesday. That's just tempting for me. <laughs> but you'll wear a wet or dry suit. I think so. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brett. Uh -huh. Still ahead, a Utah rock star working to help protect our first responders. See how this drummer's donation to St. George Police is helping save lives.
This is Fox 13 News. Thanks for staying with us. Police in St. George are now able to stay protected from COVID-19 thanks to a donation of PPE from a nonprofit group and a famous punk rock drummer from our area. Fox 13's Aaron Cox shows us how this all fell into place and how you can help out first responders too. St. George's finest receiving some new and necessary tools of the trade like masks, gloves and hand sanitizer to stay safe on the streets. None of us want to get sick. Our job is to protect the community. If we're sick, we can't do that. St. George police received $20,000 worth of personal protective equipment kits from a Salt Lake nonprofit called the Give Kids Foundation. And Brandon Steinekert, he's the drummer of the punk rock group Rancid and a founding member of the band The Used. My wife and I were just making masks at home, just trying to do our part, staying home and seeing if we could help out the community at all, if we could donate something to assisted living. Steinekert's desire to give back to his neighbors in Washington County fell hand in hand with the Give Kids Foundation's mission of helping out first responders. It's all founded and, and run by first responders, veterans, nurses, and just people in the community that want to make a difference. The giving doesn't stop with this donation. That's because Give Kits says a purchase of a PPE kit off its website allows you to donate PPE to a local police or fire department of your choice. If we can get people to get behind this, then we can take care of all the communities around the nation where they're struggling to get these supplies and, and keep them safe. There's an enemy that we all have in common right now, and together we can fight it and be a lot stronger. We have a link to the Give Kids Foundation on our website, fox13now.com. Aaron Cox, Fox 13 News, Utah. And a spokesperson for the Give Kids Foundation says they are now talking with people out in Moab about a donation to first responders there in the coming weeks. Still ahead with more people looking to head outside to beat cabin fever from the pandemic, state parks in the southern part of our state are dealing with overcrowding. We talk with park managers at Gunlock State Park about how they're handling all of this. And a Utah company documenting history as it happens. We're going to show you how they are piecing together the story of COVID-19 in Ogden. We'll be right back. Live from Fox 13 Studios, this is Fox 13 News at 9. A busy weekend for Utah State Parks with a total of five parks reaching their own respective capacities. Taking a look at this statewide map, with the exception of Goblin Valley over in eastern Utah, most of the parks reaching capacity were in southern Utah. Sand Hollow, Quail Creek, Snow Canyon, all maxing out. As did Gunlock State Park, which faced its own set of unique challenges. When you get crowds like that that are coming from every direction, it's a battle. A Las Vegas woman had to be rescued from the Gunlock Falls area in Gunlock State Park Saturday afternoon after injuring herself from a cliff jump into the falls. Was yesterday the busiest you've ever seen the falls? Uh, I would have to say one of the top three for sure. Pictures showing large crowds at the Falls area on Saturday, despite it being closed early in the day. The downside is that because they are spectacular, Lots of people wanted to go and see them. Parking inside of Gunlock is controlled by staff, but the road into the park was flooded with visitors entering the falls areas from other access points. No matter how hard you push for responsible recreation and that kind of thing, it, it's difficult to control crowds when they get that big. And the crowd leaving a mess behind for the park staff to clean up. I got here at 6.30 and started picking up the the remains of yesterday. We are going to be cleaning up for the next week. It's been a stressful time for park staff across the state trying to give guests the best experience possible while staying safe themselves. You care about your visitors. You want everybody to go home with a memory, not in a not in an ambulance. And and when that happens, it's it's hard for us. Most of the people posting on social media over the weekend admitting that they were visiting the parks in southern Utah from places like Las Vegas or even California. Park managers encourage those from outside of the state of Utah to follow their home state's directives and orders. An Ogden company is creating a unique way for the community to document the COVID-19 pandemic. Fox 13's John Franke shows us how they're coming together. 
We are living in uncertain and difficult times. This video is called Ogden Unite. We're from Ogden and we all love Ogden. A few weeks ago, Casey LaRose and his co-workers came up with the idea to put it together. We wanted to see how people were dealing with COVID-19 in their daily lives. Instead of using professional video, this story is told by everyday citizens. We wanted to see people in their communities. Through social media, Ogden residents were asked to submit positive messages. We had probably over 300 video clips total from over 100 people submitting, and we were hoping for, you know, at least like 50 or so. So we far exceed our expectations. Casey and his team, all Ogden natives. Ogden has such an awesome spirit. Spent several days weaving those videos into one story. We wanted people to be able to see themselves and, you know, see how we cope with difficult times. Images of children, pets, healthcare workers, and social distancing tell this story. Hopefully this video is used later on, 50 years, 100 now, we can look back and see what it was like. The video lasts three and a half minutes. We are on all the time it takes to show light. I was super excited to see that we really didn't get anything that was negative. Is stronger than the darkness. We have a link to the complete video on our website at fox13now.com. In Salt Lake City, John Franke, Fox 13 News, Utah. Still to come, a local animal shelter is seeing a huge spike in adoptions during this pandemic. We'll show you why this shelter in West Valley City is running out of adoptable animals. Sharing another photo from a viewer, Michael Bowman, looking up at Twin Peaks, seeing that river flowing as the snow melting. Of course, we've been accelerating that spring runoff with the warm past temperatures, but do we keep it warm? I'll let you know after the break. You're watching Fox 13 News. Let's connect. Animal shelters in West Valley City are facing a unique problem during this pandemic. Not enough adoptable animals. Fox 13's Lauren Steinbrecher explains why they are running out of dogs and cats and how they're using this situation to help other shelters in the area. This room is always filled with the barking, maybe whining, of dogs hoping for a new home. But if you listen now, you hear nothing except silence. It's not even really a problem. It's like a bragging right. So our adoptions over the pandemic, so over the last 30 days while we've been shut down, um, have doubled from what they uh, are on average. Doubling adoption numbers means the Taylorsville and West Valley City Animal Shelter is running out of animals. It is good. It's amazing. Um, it means that, you know, people are looking to adopt and um, are going through our counseling process and doing it responsibly and um, you know, getting a, a new friend and, and figuring out what's going to be best for their lifestyle. They say in the past week alone, they've adopted out more than 100 dogs and cats, which isn't just good news for this shelter. Others across the valley now have a place to turn to help connect their own animals with a new family. So we're taking dogs from West Jordan, from South Jordan, from South Salt Lake, from Weber County. Um, we've taken some of their dogs uh, to help them out as well and, uh, and gotten them homes. It's probably no surprise that the stay at home order had a hand in this, leading families to bring in a new furry bundle of joy. The community is really coming together and helping all the animals. If you do decide to expand your family by four legs, here are some tips from the Humane Society. Buy supplies before you bring your new pet home, like food, toys, ID tags, etc. Set up your daily routine, including walks and feeding time. Implement training, discipline, and most importantly, patience to help your fur baby stay calm and feel safe. Crate train them before you head back to work. The Humane Society says animals see crates as a den or their personal space. He's a good boy, can you see it? See it. Oh, is that my good boy? See it. Hopefully in no time, Fluffy or Fido will become a part of your pack. Something the shelter loves to see. Their space empty and your home, your heart filled. Lauren Steinbrecher, Fox 13 News, Utah. Still to come, one of the biggest changes to our lives during COVID-19, of course, kids staying home, away from school and friends for long periods of time. Coming up, how you can help them adjust to a normal after the pandemic. Coming up in sports, we have highlights from home, plus Tony Finau and Olympic gold medalist Sage Kotzenberg from Park City. He'll tell us where he was when the coronavirus pandemic hit.
We continue to look at how we here in Utah can bounce back from COVID-19 in our new series, The Rebound. Our state is already starting to reopen, but it's going to take much more than businesses reopening for things to be back to some sense of normalcy. Lindsay Boach spoke with one expert who says there's some science to helping your children ease out of isolation. This is a global pandemic. Things are going to be different as we move back out of quarantine and, and into society. These past few weeks have been hard on most Americans. We are all missing out on the things that we're used to, um, things that used to feel really good and make us really happy. And as we start thinking about what the future might look like, children's psychologist Laura Anthony says we could be seeing some changes in our children's behavior. Most of us as parents are seeing signs of stress or sadness or grief or frustration, disappointment in our kids. Um, and we, we, we need to really be okay with letting them feel those things. Anthony says it's important to talk to our kids and share our feelings with them and explain to them what the next few weeks may hold. For example, if you go out and about having to wear a mask, Staying six feet apart and remembering to wash your hands. Our kids are going to feel um, more in control when they know what they can do as they're kind of coming back out into society. Um, I mean, it's good for the rest of us too. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say the reasons why we need to do those things. She also says it's important to try and lessen the stress that we put on ourselves as parents working from home and helping with schoolwork. We're all just doing the best that we can. And I think parents should not feel guilty. Offer themselves a little bit of kindness and a little bit of grace. They're not in this alone. We're all struggling and all you can do is the best you can. That's all any of us can do is the best that we can. I'm Lindsay Boach reporting. For more stories and resources, including information about unemployment, job searches, and small business loans, head to fox13now.com. Click on the Rebound Utah tab at the top of the page. If you have a story that showcases Utah rebounding from the pandemic, email rebound at fox13now.com. Well, there is a lot of history about flying coast to coast that you might not know. So Fox 13's photojournalist Taylor Murray gives us a new perspective on some aviation history in this week's Utah Elevated. There are still a few around out in the middle of nowhere, but in populated areas, they've been pretty well destroyed. I'm Patrick Wiggins, and we're here to talk about concrete navigation arrows. Today, we don't even think about it. You get in the airplane, you strap in, you lean back, and you know, and you wake up and you're at your destination. It wasn't always that way. Imagine in the old days, you're trying to get from one side of the country to the other, and it was before navigation as we know it today. So they put a bunch of these concrete arrows on the ground, and basically you just flew from one side of the country to the other, looking at the ground, uh, following across these arrows, and hoping you don't run into anything. They were put in to help the mail pilots. Uh, it was That's what basically got a lot of aviation started, was flying mail. Many of them had towers with uh, lights on them that would flash at night. Some of them were kerosene powered, some of them were electrically powered. As you can see from this arrow, it has them turn slightly, but you can kind of, you know, if you stand on there and look back, you can see where that other one is. And if you look forward, it's pointed right at where the one over there at Lake Point is. So it works. On a beautiful day like this, it was no problem, but I just cannot imagine what it must have been like at night, bad weather, and trying to get that mail through. I've got so much respect for the people that flew long before me that, that, that as many of them lived as they did. Wow, that is incredible and a good day for flying at least 
back then, Breck, they wouldn't have any clouds to deal yeah. with. They'd be able to see those arrows. Yeah, at least across most of central and southern Utah, flying was okay. Northern Utah through central Utah, a little different story. Now, I want to share just right at sunset. This was in the view in Moab where you enjoyed the sunshine, but looking further northward, Grand County, even up as far north as Uinta County, you've been seeing some thunderstorms rolling through throughout the afternoon into the evening. Now, along the Wasatch Front, we've got some clouds, rain threatening, approaching as a cool front is moving through the state. That will keep some active weather going with the possibility of some light to moderate rainfall on the Wasatch Front, at least for the next couple of hours. We've seen the wind direction change out of the northwest, and that'll bring in some cooler air. We're actually going to find overnight lows quite a bit colder than what we've been experiencing here over the past couple of days. All right, let's take a look at your watering guide where over the weekend, some of you getting rain mainly through central northeastern Utah. The recommendation is you look across the state where as we go from Box Elder County uh, towards southern Utah into eastern Utah, the recommendation is once. Now, the Wasatch back, uh, Cache County, Rich County, Daggett counties, you don't even have to water your lawn. That's the recommendation, at least, from conservewater.utah.gov. And, of course, where we've been seeing some scorching temperatures across southern Utah, the recommendation is twice. So, again, this is just the information I'm getting. Many people are saying, oh, I'm tempted to do that a little bit more because after that dry April, trying to kind of catch up. But Mother Nature has been helping out a little bit, at least across northern into central Utah. And we're going to see some rain showers, as I mentioned, moving throughout the rest of the evening as we're seeing still some active weather towards eastern Utah, some isolated thunderstorms that have been roaring through, where you've been seeing that active weather really here over the past 24 to 36 hours. Now along the Wasatch Front, we're seeing the development, kind of a resurgence of moisture associated with the cool front moving through. Seeing some light rain currently in Tremont moving over towards Cache Valley. In its sight, it looks like the Wasatch Front, mainly north of Salt Lake City, but portions of north Salt Lake City could uh, at least see a few raindrops here as we move once we get about midnight or so. There's the cool front. As this moisture pushes away for tomorrow, we're going to be bringing in some sunshine and temperatures. Well, as that cool front tracking through, we're going to be looking at afternoon highs a little bit cooler than what we found today. So let's take a look at the potential where we'll see the rain, where most of it falls really in the next six hours. It's central Utah, northeastern Utah, portions of the Wasatch Front to extreme northern Utah. Again, by after midnight, maybe by 2, 3 a.m., they should be winding down. And then we don't see any rain Monday into Tuesday as well, keeping it dry. So let's take a look at your hour-by-hour hour forecast. As you can see, the whole day, sunny skies. Look at those temperatures starting off into the 40s. Now, there are some locations overnight will be down into the 30s, areas such as Park City, Colville, Morgan, Cache Valley. You're going to see overnight lows dipping down into the mid to upper 30s. So a little bit more of a chilly night. And again, even along the Wasatch Front, experiencing 40s, where over the past few days we've been in the 50s, even low 60s to start off your day. Of course, we've had cloudy conditions. Tomorrow, it's sunshine all throughout the day. And afternoon highs getting up into the mid to upper 60s. That's about where we should be for this time of year. We're not going to stay in the 60s for too long, though as we're going to see temperatures from Ogden through uh, Provo in the mid to upper 60s, 50s in Park City as well as in Evanston. Still holding on to 80s in Moab, even though they'll be uh, maybe a degree or two cooler than what we found today. Expected high in St. George tomorrow, 86 degrees, where for St. George, it's 80s to 90s to mid 90s and staying in the 90s the remainder of the week. Looks like it'll be another warm weekend with clear conditions and not a chance of precipitation here for the next seven days. Now for northern Utah, 60s, 70s, then 80s. Another cool front hits, bringing some clouds, dropping temperatures, but it's not bringing rain. 70s back on Friday and then 80s for the weekend. Yeah, we're going to keep these temperatures above normal, which means we're going to keep that spring runoff accelerated and those rivers running fast. Well, Jeff, a lot of people sometimes forget that sports is indeed a business, and COVID-19 has really smacked around the industry. Yeah, it yeah. sure has. The sudden disappearance of sports will erase at least $12 billion in revenue and hundreds of thousands of jobs, according to an analysis conducted for ESPN. That will more than double if the college football and NFL schedules are wiped out by the coronavirus pandemic. Utah and Tony Finau was playing great before the PGA Tour season came to a halt. He tied for sixth at Torrey Pines, then finished second at the Phoenix Open, losing in a playoff. He took a month off for the season, 
when it stopped, but he's now playing golf again and looking forward to the return of the season in mid-June. He's planning on playing 10 of the next 13 events. I was looking forward to the meat of the season, no doubt, which we all know is kind of starts at Augusta and it works its way all the way through the summer with all the major championships. So I was, I was really looking forward to that stretch. Tony Finau. As a competitor, I can't wait. Well, the schedule is hectic, he but was, he's recently um, moved one that uh, I'm looking forward to. And I'm happy that they uh, were able to just add those events in the fall and not just cancel them completely. Park City native Sage Katzenberg was the first American to win the gold medal in the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Since then, he's focused on backcountry snowboarding and creating movies. He said when you get to your mid-20s, that's a little old for snowboarding. But he also said he really feels for those future Olympians who have the Olympics maybe postponed. We were in Alaska in the middle of March, actually, when all the quarantining and everything started happening and the borders were closing. And we were actually in Alaska filming. <laughs> we had a crazy travel back to Utah, or I did. You know, we had to drive through the Canada, the border, the border to Canada, fly to uh, Vancouver, and then drive a couple hours because our trucks, we left them up in Whistler. <laughs> and then the next day, that's when that's when they announced that they were going to start closing the borders and everything. We're like, all right, I just got to get home right now. <laughs> All right, we'll hear more from the Tony and Sage coming up tonight on the Fox 13 Sports page. Plus, we'll check in with Real Salt Lake and Jazz beat writer for the Salt Lake Tribune, Eric Walden, on his thoughts on what will happen with the rest of the NBA season. Okay, it's time now for you to shine. Another round of highlights from home. Here's the Utah SWAT competitive basketball team staying healthy but still putting in the work. This is the seventh grade team. This is Frederick Chavez and a friend with some martial arts outdoors. Over. And how about Oscar the Superstar? Over. This is a fun video from Chris Cowley. Good boy! This is also impressive. Luke Sanders on the hoverboard. Cade Metaloff showing off the skills with the basketball. And this is great from Jack Radford from the roof. Go! Yeah, if you want to be on Highlights from Home, send your videos to sports at fox13now.com. In fact, I shot a video in my backyard with my son. I just might have to share it tomorrow. We'll what see. about Tony Finau? He's got all sorts of kids there. He takes lots of pictures. Is he going to send in anything for Highlights from Home? He should, right? He's got a lot of kids. He's got five of them. He's enjoying spending a lot of time with them. And on the sports page tonight, we'll check in on his TikTok game. Ooh, I know he's it's pretty strong. Dancer. Yeah, he's a good dancer. Thank you, Jeff. We'll be right back. Finally on Fox 13, members of the Washington Heights Church gathered at Ogden Regional Hospital today to show their appreciation for health care workers all through chalk art. More than a hundred of the church's members spread out across three of the hospital's parking lots, of course to adhere to social distancing, but also to spread their appreciation as wide as they could. So we got a bunch of people out here today just showing their appreciation through art. And so that way when they come into work tomorrow morning on most of those areas where all the employees come in, they're going to get to see all the art. It's going to be the best thing ever. And the church says anyone from the community is welcome to join future activities of theirs that show appreciation to those on the front lines. Looks like they had some nice weather out there as well. So hopefully no raindrops up there in the Ogden area yeah, to wash away. Chalk, chalk might get smeared a little bit tonight, which maybe some brief rain. Sorry to say. I the hope you can hold so it off for us. <laughs> well, thanks for watching Fox 13 News at 9. Don't go anywhere. Quick cast is up next. Have a yes. great night. Sports page after that.